Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson. I'm an attorney from the Lohman Abdo Law Firm here in Hudson, Wisconsin, and I'm the political and government correspondent. Uh, and maybe legal issues too, since I know a little bit about those. But we're here today with a very recognizable guest, Shannon Zimmerman, our state representative. All right, Shannon, welcome Jamie, back to the thank show. thank you again for the invitation. I always appreciate it. Yes, and uh, so we are uh, here. Uh, this is late April. Um, we are in the biennium budget mm -hmm. battle. And so you're here to give us an update. Um, you uh, won re-election in November to your fourth term? Is that That's right? correct, fourth okay. term. Yep. Fourth term. And so, uh, we, you know, you had talked about what you wanted to accomplish and stuff like that when you were running. Um, you've um, been on the Joint Finance Committee yep. for, is it three years now? This is my third, uh, third budget for the state third of Wisconsin. Budget. Yep, great. So, uh, we're going into the budget and we got those notices about the public being able to comment. Yep. So, let's start there. Um, are there still opportunities for live testimony or is it, uh, is it too late for that or written um, comments? Great. Um, again, thank you for the invitation. And, and maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll just give a, a really caffeinated overview of the process, which will answer your question there. So <clears throat> in the state of Wisconsin, the governor will draft, the, take the first step in the budget process. Uh, the, any governor, he or she would draft a budget proposal that budget is received by the Joint Committee of Finance. Um, I am one of six members in the uh, House uh, in the state of Wisconsin for uh, the Republican Party, and then we also have minority Democrats uh, that also participate on that. Our job is exactly kind of as you described. So we begin our work uh, by analyzing. We do this in cooperation with uh, what's called the Legislative Fiscal Bureau. Think of them as Wisconsin's accountants, right, and, and our financial analysts. They go through it, they help us understand, interpret, all that sort of great stuff. We then seek public comment. One, people can go online uh, at, at the um, uh, state websites and still submit their opinions, perspectives, thoughts, ideas, comments. In addition to that, over the past four weeks, we have been traveling the state of Wisconsin, uh, visiting a variety of towns. We do public hearings. We do not talk as, as, as committee members. We are there to listen. So uh, every speaker has two minutes to say whatever's on their mind. They can thank us and cheer us on, or they might have some constructive feedback or some ideas, things that are passionate to them. But uh, we travel. So what are, when folks go to these hearings, are they commenting on the governor's budget, or is there already a framework put forward from the Republican side, because Republicans control both the House and the Senate? Yep. I, I, I don't, there, there's not two Republican budgets, right? One no. for each house. No. But is there a Republican framework in response or do people just comment generally on the status of things where the governor's budget proposal is out there and they're waiting for Republicans? Most, Where's that at? Great question. <clears throat> Most often they're commenting on the governor's budget either for or against. Do we like this? Tweak this? Um, so most often that is the basis for which they will form their opinion and take their position. Okay. So, and Governor Evers' uh, budget, if you just boiled it down without any partisan spin on it, yeah. it, it appears to me, and I have not looked at it in mm -hmm. detail, is, um, you know, in the, in the sense that there was a surplus, yeah. uh, we're in the middle of a surplus, uh, not a lot in terms of tax cuts, but a lot of ideas where more spending could happen. Is that basically what the governor's? You nailed it. Yeah, so you may not have gone through the whole thing, but you've got, you've got the cliff notes and that, that really is it. So let me just put a couple things in perspective. I am in my fourth term <clears throat> and I said this last week while I was in Madison. One of the hardest things that I have struggled with in this position is turning off the local business owner kind of mindset because it is different than how a government runs. For example, I'm, ass I'm assuming in your home budget, you have to prioritize and you're thoughtful and you have to balance your budget and your spending and all that sort of great stuff. And government agencies, God bless them, and they are necessary and needed, sometimes they just don't think that way. It's, I had this last time, I need that plus X plus Y. Last budget cycle, <clears throat> we passed an $89 billion overall biennium budget. And roughly 45 billion a year. That's exactly correct, right? 
the governor's proposal would take us to 105, so $105 billion uh, in, in total spending. In, and out of that $89 billion, we're sitting here with a $5 billion surplus coming out of that two years. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I don't think people are really surprised, number one, that we have a surplus, because I think m- m- most states do, nor do I think that they're confused as to where it came from. This is part of the federal stimulus is in all their grand forms. It trickles into the states. It's not that, I mean, I'd love to say we're doing really great. And we are, in a lot of cases, we are doing really great. But this is federal money. It's money that you or your kids or your grandkids are going to have to pay off and be accountable for at some point in time. So we have a $7 billion surplus, right? That's a lot of money. Now, I want to just carve that out for a second. Of that $7 billion, we look very thoughtfully and carefully at what would be considered ongoing expenditures and one-time expenditures because some of it is being treated differently. So it's not all fungible to us. We can't just go spend it. Um, so, yes, there, there's a surplus, and uh, we are just in the middle of, of, of initiating now the joint finance portion of this where we take it into what's called executive committee hearings. We can say, yes, we like what the governor uh, proposed for the Department of Natural Resources, or we have the ability to modify it. Now, keep in mind, whatever we modify it to, we know in the back of our mind we need Governor Evers to sign it at the end of the day uh, because he has that ability to do that. So it's not just, this is what you said, this is what we said, and we cross our arms. Last budget, there was some uh, collaboration there. I mean, the governor signed the budget that, that we modified, and it worked. I anticipate the same thing again. Okay. So there's always hope. There's right. always hope, yeah. yes. Yeah, because otherwise it's a never-ending process uh, of going back and forth. And the governor in Wisconsin does still have a line item veto that's been softened over the years compared yeah. to what it used to be. But um, there, there's still that potential. The most powerful governor in all of the U.S. is, uh, in, in my opinion, Wisconsin, because uh, his ability, I mean, you can literally strike letters, right. words, and, and change meanings. Zeros can go from 10 to 1 million. That is right. exactly correct. That is exactly correct. So uh, with that, uh, you know, the priorities. First thing I saw was, uh, and I'm hearing constituents say the same thing, because they're wondering, what are we doing going to a referendum on an operating, you know, raising the operating levy when the state is sitting there with all those extra funds and surplus funds? and I tried to explain the balance between state aid and property tax and so forth. But is there, has there been any thought, because the, the size of the biennium budget is grunt. Now it's now yeah. 90 billion and probably gonna go up from there. It might be 95 billion when the dust settles after this budget, who knows. Yeah. But yet we're still sitting there with a very small rainy day fund, yeah. right? Is there been any thought of increasing that rainy day fund so we take out the roller coasters yeah. in the budget. First of all, as it relates to education, and I know you know this intimately, um, it is a complex formula and it is rather uh, unique to Wisconsin, I think, and I've said this publicly many times, I think that the funding formula is in desperate need of modernization. You can have town A and town B 10 miles apart and you have a radical, and, and, and population's the same, composition's roughly the same, and you have a pretty substantial difference in funding. Why is that, right? And, and, and there, right. there's reasons, but we, we, we don't have time to get into all right, that. Right, right. Um, so in general, yes, we have this surplus. And we, when we think about education, here's the thing. We have to look not only at the moment we're in, but we have to look down another budget or two. Generally speaking, and this, is, you, I, this goes hopefully without saying, you know, these are the ongoing expenses. When we put an upper in education, it's going to persist generally and keep going. That's you know, right. because schools depend on that. The reason that we're very thoughtful when it comes to those things is because if we overdo it by some, you know, by, by you know, and there'll be differing opinions on this, and we come and, and we don't have a surplus next budget cycle, well, then we have to raise taxes. And that does affect our elderly, our retirees, our fixed income people. Sure. So it is always a very, very delicate balancing act. The surplus, um, in my mind, this is simply how I think about it. Okay, we're going to have our ongoing expenses. Public education, education in general, is absolutely uh, going to be a top priority. And just for people when they talk about priorities, for example, um, educational funding is now over one third. It's the largest single expenditure of our our overall budget. So Are you including the uh, higher education as well in it? 
No, I'm talking K-12. Okay. K-12, 33.5 or 33.7 percent of our GPR funds go to K-12. Um, so it's it, it, it's not trivial. It, it, it is substantial. Um, and back to your question about you know people wondering, why are you going to an operating referendum? As I said, in my opinion, the overall formula needs to be updated, but we have to have a, a real conversation at some point in time statewide about the composition and, and the stats and figures inside of our educational system. For example, over the past, I think it's either six or eight years, we are down 40,000 students in K-12 statewide. And, and, and that, that's a real number because what happens is our, our, our spend keeps going up. I mean, every budget, you know, whether it goes up enough for everybody, it goes up every budget. Students are declining. And so the amount of revenue per student is increasing. But at some point in time, I think there's a real conversation that has to be had about, okay, where can we implement more shared services and or consolidation? Because if okay. we have 400 and... 20-ish schools statewide. I mean, I'm talking rural to urban. So I know we've talked about this a lot. I am a big fan. I, I, I believe in the importance of education for our workforce future, for our future in general. But these conversations have to be held at some point. Even Wisconsin Public Radio, uh, I think it was either last week or the week before, had an article that they published exactly on this point, that consolidation has to start to be on the table to talk about if we're going to solve the long-term funding issue. And, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And we see it on our level here in the Hudson School District, just with the discussions about how many elementary schools we have. Yeah. And, uh, people don't want to see mega schools, but at the same time, when you have schools that are either one or only two sections, and as you mentioned, you lose a few students. If you go from 22 students per class to 18 students per class, yeah. uh, you're losing state funding, um, and but you're not saving any expense because you still need the same number of teachers. You're exactly correct. And, and if you think about this also, Jamie, Look at our, our Hudson, Greater St. Croix area. We are exploding with growth, right? Companies are coming over, people are moving over here. The other very real element here is a school district is not on the tax roll. But let's say we had, I'm just gonna pick a, a number. Say we had six buildings. And the reality is that we really only need five. The right thing to do is free the one, potentially it becomes usable in another form. It's great for whomever's using it, company or other. Um, it's likely back on the tax rolls now where that's helping maybe to offset or dilute some of the overall tax burden on our community. There's just a lot of really good things that could happen as a result of at least having the conversation. The other thing that I would comment on is I went to a really small school, public school in Wisconsin, you know, graduating class of 49 kids. My sons went to... Bigger than mine. Mine was oh, 45. Okay. So, yeah. so, so I'm going to speculate then you and I are probably not all that different in this regard. I look at the curriculum at a Hudson or a River Falls these days, uh, St. Croix Central. There's some really cool stuff that, that, based on your size and ability, that you're able to teach, to deliver. I probably didn't get that. I, I, I had a great experience, but I probably got the basics, right? And so somewhere between we're really small and we're, we're, we're having to support a whole bunch of schools that maybe we should be consolidating to the mega school because... Let's face it, MPS in some of their examples, we can see that the mega school doesn't necessarily work either. The answer, probably like a lot of things, is in the middle. Right. And uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. So what we were talking about when it came to like Hudson's example and you were using the hypothetical of six to five and so forth. Uh, so there's two types of consolidation. There's uh, bigger districts that are losing students because just a reality throughout yep. all of Wisconsin is yep. that student enrollment is down and you used a very large number and it's over the course of six to eight years. But even in um, Hudson, that number is hundreds of students yep. over that eight years. So uh, you need to be efficient. And at some point, if you're going to say, if we're going to increase our uh, commitment to education, we have to have some kind of showing that there's efficiencies. And I know inertia is huge, and in being a product, as you mentioned, a small school district myself, with another school district just five miles down the road, yeah. you're really not increasing student travel time when you when you do consolidate those. No. But 
because there's that community pride and so forth, oh, we can't oh, consolidate yeah. because then there's a fight, okay, who gets to keep their high school and who has to be the one that has the elementary school and so yeah. forth. Um, our superintendent, um, Nicolette, came from Iowa and they have those all the time where we're talking about school districts that are square miles wise, hundreds of square yeah. miles, but only you know less than 400 kids in the whole school district. So anyway, those discussions need to be had. Um, I wanna, because we could spend a whole half hour on certainly probably could. two hours just on and education. I appreciate, by the way, just to say, I appreciate as, as, as a school board member president, your willingness to, to acknowledge that because sometimes as a legislator, I will tell you, sometimes people don't. It's just send more money. and and. Right. You know, I'm willing to entertain that. We have to look at its strategic investments, but please, let's just have the full conversation because it, it is relevant if we're going to do this right. Right. And I think when it comes to, uh, you know, education and there's that whole balance of uh, state aid and local property tax dollars, um, we've seen a big shift um, where in Hudson we've had to rely more on the property tax. We've been doing our cuts as much as we can yeah. and uh, it's just been a reality that you're switching. So with education, and uh, this is going to be a theme in the other areas of the budget as well, is just keeping pace with inflation. For example, mm -hmm. the revenue cap. Yeah. Hudson for 20 of the last 22 years, we uh, uh, under levied. Our yeah. local school board chose not to levy at the max because we felt we didn't need it. We could fund our schools adequately yeah. without doing that. But because that cap has not kept pace with inflation, it's a, it was before you were in the legislature, so you're not at fault. But when they don't cap it or don't keep pace with inflation after 10, 11 years, that ends up catching yeah. up with us. Yeah. Now, the only time that we had a really good catch up, that was the year that Governor Walker ran for re-election, mm -hmm. and we saw a, a Basically, everything that had been withheld over years by not keeping pace with inflation was put into the budget. We had a nice, healthy jolt to our budget. Sure. But that's, that was then, and we haven't had anything since yeah. that time happened. So um, do you see that? Will there be some kind of attempt to catch up, if you will, with where we were inflation-wise? So last budget, as you know, um, the Joint Committee of Finance initiated, and it would ultimately be approved and signed by the governor, the use of federal dollars, you know, this is federal funds from the, the CARES Act and all kinds of other things, um, to be utilized uh, for some of the educational funding. One of the other things that it did, of course, is that now kind of takes the state out for a cycle. I said then, and I'll say it again, uh, that I understand and recognize we did that. I, it was the right thing to do for the taxpayers of Wisconsin, but I also know we have to catch up. We've got we've to recover and call some of that back. Because, you, I mean, the one thing that you didn't want to see, and no one wants to see, is those federal dollars, because they come with strings attached, yep. being uh, don't, uh, dedicated to areas that are recurring expenses. Because that federal money's yep. here today, it's gone tomorrow, That's and right. then the state's expected to pick up the difference. So for those districts that were trying not to yep. use those monies for ongoing expense, that's yep. where we're, that's where the discussion's at. Exactly so. correct. So to your question now, um, the short answer is all things are being looked at when it comes to educational funding and there's not just one area, right? There's the formula where money is get put into, there's what's called categorical, and you know that very well, the different categories of very deliberate and specific funding things like special education, these are real right. numbers for school There's districts. talk about, spe speaking of special education, 60% mm -hmm. of what it actually costs to educate a child that needs, has those special needs. Yep. Um, that would be an increase, quite a, quite a big increase, but do you think that that could be accomplished? I speculate, and I'm just one representative, but I speculate what will ultimately come out at the end of the day is a blend. I think that there's going there's there is recognition that that's a real expenditure that schools have to deal with, and, and, and you know they, they're moving monies around to to accom accomplish that. Um, I think it'll be a blend for every point, for every one percentage point in special education increase in funding, it is seventeen million dollars. So statewide, statewide. So yep. so if you know to, to, we're I think thirty or so over thirty percent right now. So to go up a point, you know, to get to sixty, it's. 30 times 17 million. So it's not an insignificant right. number. Half a billion dollars. Right. That's, you know, for in so, one year. In, yes. So, so a whole billion for one biennium. Right. So I believe that at the end of the day, um, there will be a blended approach where monies will be put into the formula, special education. Each of the last couple budgets I've been a part of has have all seen increases because um, these are unique conditions inside the school, right, where we have uh, students 
who can benefit from from some different uh, approaches or treatments and so forth. So it's 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 a legitimate thing that schools deal with. We recognize it. We've you know tried to keep creeping it up, but I think at the end of the day, you're going to see a blend by the time this all gets done. That's typically what's happened. With our time, I want to move off education. The next big area in the budget. Um, and one that uh, I have interest in being a lawyer the last 33 years, and that is criminal justice. Yep. And I got my start as being a, uh, an assistant district attorney over in Eau Claire County. Okay. Uh, what it's, I think it's a universally, universally accepted idea that what we're paying, um, the government paid lawyers in our criminal justice system, which we're relying on yeah. to keep, hold up the system, is almost criminal in what we're paying them. It just has not kept up. Right. And, you know, and I know, understand about trying to be frugal, but eventually it gets to be a public safety issue. Yep. You agree, disagree? I fully agree. It is a public safety issue. And my son, as you know, is also a, a criminal defense attorney here in the St. Croix Valley. And so I'll give him the lawyer jokes and he gives me the politician jokes right. and we still get on fine. But, you know, truly what's happening here is this. Imagine you are the victim of a crime and now because the system has an inability to even move itself appropriately at a reasonable pace, everybody's harmed by that. Right. All parties involved are harmed by that. You have <clears throat> counties in Wisconsin where they can't even get a district attorney to take a job in, in, right. or, or an assistant district attorney because the pay, by comparison in this hyper-competitive market, no one will take the job. And so this is, in my opinion, a public safety issue. There's so many levers in here, right? Funding is definitely one because <clears throat> increases in salaries across the board. Doesn't matter where, what industry or sector you're a part of. I, I'm in tech, I see it in tech. The company I'm still running, I did, we see it all the time, right? So it's just hyper competitive. So I do believe that it's a, it is a, safe, uh, a public safety issue. Um, I do believe that this budget cycle, that improvements will be made. And the perception sometimes by the public, whether right or wrong, Jamie, and I'm, I'm sure you'll agree, well, those lawyers make so much money already. They're, they're, you know, but that's, it's bigger than that because these lawyers paid a lot of money to go to school. They can make a lot more money in the private sector, private practice, and then we're going to ask them out of the goodness of their heart to go do this. So no different than, I would say, God bless our CNAs in the Hudson area that, that show up every day at our nursing centers and caring for the elderly because they're not getting rich either and they're under huge uh, price pressure. So um, it's a theme we're hearing in, in every single agency, but I believe we're going to see some positive change in that regard this budget cycle. Um, so not only more pay, but more positions. I mean, we, we need more prosecutors because of yeah. uh, the caseloads. They're just not able to, to move them. And... Uh, same thing, judges, do you think that their pay would also uh, so be being looked at? The request at the state level is for overall uh, state employee compensation increases and so forth. And in this environment, you know, I believe that will be favored. You know, we, we can't avoid it. Most people who work in state government, you know, aren't getting rich and don't do it for the money necessarily. But there comes a point where, you know, the imbalance is so great that we have to take a good look at that, right? Because right. the options, I mean... You know, the, 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 the examples we always hear are, you know, quick trip, right? I mean, you can work at a quick trip now and make a really good wage. They do a great job with bonuses for their team members. And, um, and, and, and you know, you, you can take care of your family, believe it or not, working in those, those locations. So uh, this is something that absolutely will be looked at. And, and other part of the equation is law enforcement, our first responders holistically. We're growing. And there's just more people here in Hudson, town of Hudson, Somerset, you know, in River Falls. So we have to expect that, okay, our services are just going to be strained and we're going to have to address that somehow. We see it more here than maybe there, maybe in northern Wisconsin because of the growth condition. Last budget thing, and then we got to go yeah. to non-budget items, uh, would be the status of our roads where uh, 20 years ago, Wisconsin was always near the top as far as condition of our roads. People yep. would compliment us that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we've seen that, I think, again, another universally accepted notion is that a quality of our roads is way down. Yep. And getting to a crisis mode only because cars are more efficient and we're having more electric cars in the roads. So the oh. amount of money being raised in the gas tax, do you see that funding uh, being impacted in, 
is this the budget to address that, or do you think maybe that's the next budget cycle? Okay, we'll be so there's two questions, I think, in what you're saying there. Absolutely. There's one, which is what is the long-term sustainable road infrastructure transportation funding model? Historically, it's been gas tax. You are correct. Uh, most, or a lot of our vehicles now are not requiring that, so th that's going to be there, there's going to be a change there. Uh, so, from a formula perspective, um, maybe we're not quite there yet as percentages of, of cars on the road, but we're getting there. We're going to have to look at the formula and modify it. Next, part, second question: Is now the cycle, or is it maybe the next cycle where, where you know we put an upper in infrastructure and roads? Back to our surplus. First of all, I, that surplus, and for all of us who are taxpayers and on the hook to re repay that, um, in the grand scheme of the things we do, number one, be, I, I'm, I'm a believer in frugality. Let's be frugal with our money. Let's also make sure that those who are on the hook for that, you get some income tax or property tax relief. I think that's gotta be part of the conversation. But when people talk, excuse me, about one-time funding, I look at it this way. I have to, with my hand over my heart, be able to believe that whatever dollars we're putting in here now in one-time funding for X, 10 years from now, I can still go to the grocery store in Hudson and stand behind it because I believe it's still generating return. Roadways in St. Croix County are one place I think that could benefit from that. We are growing, we're already behind. Um, I've talked to the council folks in, in, mm -hmm. in Hudson and, and River Falls, we are already chasing. Um, I'm gonna use the word exodus because it's almost at that level from Minnesota coming over here right now. It right. is unbelievable the number of Minnesotans coming over here. That's great, they're coming over to the right side of the St. Right. Croix, uh, of course, but that is going to create more strain. So I believe that one place that some of these funds would be strategic for us is, let's, let's deal with some of our transportation and infrastructure issues. That ties in also to affordable housing. How? because our municipalities might need to run some infrastructure, um, some roadways, some sewer, some water. We have to deal with density. We gotta, in some cases, have some smaller lot sizes so we can get more affordable homes on these lots so that families can afford them and so that we don't have a median home price in Hudson, Wisconsin of right. $600,000. Okay, so non-budgetary yeah. items. Um, there's a lot of talk with this last election on, in earlier this month in April in the Supreme Court. Yep. Abortion was the you know one of the top issues, mm -hmm. and we've got this 1849 law that has no exceptions or basically uh, life of mother. basically none. Yeah, life yep. of the mother is the only one. So, do you see anything being done on that issue, or is it going to be left to the political leanings of Supreme Court justices? I, um, I have <clears throat> been public that I am a pro-life representative. I believe that every life is so valuable, um, but I also understand what sometimes are the very unique circumstances. Um, I know off camera we were talking a little bit right. about this. And I think that when we look at life, we understand that there are, how do you tell a husband and look him in the eye and say, your wife is going to die but you don't have any options. That is very difficult for me, and, and it, it challenges our faith and our ideals and all that sort of great stuff. So I do believe that there are some minor, you know, I, I, for those who would advocate the other direction, Jamie, mm -hmm. who say we can have abortion, you know, up until whatever late stage, oh, come on. I mean, that, that's, that's, I don't believe in that at all either. I would much rather these things be dealt with with the legislative body. Mm -hmm. We have 99 in my house. There's 33 senators. We are the greatest representation of our unique districts and the positions that those districts take across the state. I'm not a big fan of executive order. I don't care what party you're from, whether it's the president, the governor, or otherwise, you're one person. And you know, those are very unique circumstances. The Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, you know, in the last election now is leaning liberal. Um, and one could conclude certainly some things from that. Again, we should not be having one individual or two individuals on any court, regardless of what the majority is, making statewide or nationwide decisions like that, I think in, in certain cases like that. At the end of the day, I speculate that there might be some rumblings uh, within the legislature around this subject, but I think ultimately the suits are, have been or are soon to be filed to challenge the current state statute and it will go to the Supreme Court. And uh, that takes 
years to possibly yep. play out, a couple of years. And in the meantime, the folks are going to be on the budget. So one other non-budgetary item, and then yep. we'll wrap up for our folks, and that is sure. your Data Privacy Act. Where does yes. that stand, and how has all this talk about artificial intelligence, how does that play in? So I have spent over 25 years in technology, blessed beyond imagination, building a business in the St. Croix Valley, um, now part of a new one, hiring people again. I love tech. And the advancements in AI, uh, chat GPT is all the rage, right? Um, this is the real deal. I've been around tech for a long time, and this is pretty impressive stuff. So if we draw parallels for a minute here, right, and we go back, and remember the steam engine was created, uh, I, I think they speculated it was a 30% overall productivity gain. There are, are chief, top economists and technologists that believe AI is going to yield a 50% gain in productivity across all sectors and industries. So it's profound. I hope we see the cure to cancer as a result of these advancements. But AI relies on data. Data, if you're volunteering, voluntarily offering it, it's fine. It trains itself on data, huge volumes of data. If, however, Jamie, you have your phone sitting on your kitchen table at home while you and your wife or your family are having private or what you perceive to be private conversations, big tech shouldn't get their hands on that. That should, there's a reasonable degree and expectation of privacy. Having a tech background, I've kind of become the tech guy in the caucus and in the legislature these days. And so I have taken the lead on the Wisconsin Data Privacy Act. I cleared the House last cycle. Well, I couldn't get it through the Senate. I'm going to get it to the governor's desk this cycle. What it will do is it will afford the residents of Hudson and Roberts and River Falls a reasonable expectation that any data collector, could be the big tech companies you think about, could be your refrigerator because we have smart refrigerators now right. with cameras. So when you're, you know, you're at Family Fresh and you're wondering if you have milk, you can pull up an app and it'll show you a camera. Well, that data could be sold to somebody else sharing your dietary habits to your health care provider. Well, we don't want those things. So um, this bill, once passed, will protect the privacy with residents of Wisconsin uh, so that they know that big tech or any other data collector can't be using your private and sensitive information when you don't know about it. And so does the act basically create an opt-in so that people don't have to affirmatively opt out? Is that... So by default, it allows for just an automatic opt-in so because it would have been too disruptive. The industries would have went crazy with that. What it will allow you to do is three things. One, you can call and contact any data collector and say, what do you have on me? Just to give you an example, in Europe, they passed what's called the GDPR. Uh, it's a uh, protection act, data privacy protection act over there. And people would go to Google and say, I want to know what you have on me. They were astounded at how much, where you've been, who you go with, what people you're around. It's, it's amazing. When you have a web mail account, if you've ever read the term, you're a lawyer. Yeah. Read the terms and conditions. Everything you send, transmit pictures and otherwise, you've surrendered to the web mail provider. Uh, so what would happen is you'd go online and say, what do you have on me? To whom have you shared or sold it to? Because you kind of want to know that, right? And then third and finally... Keep it, thank you, you can use it, or no, delete it and remove it, please. It's really simple. I probably thought of other things we could have done that would have been more advanced, but let's start there and just protect Wisconsin residents. All right, excellent. Thanks for that explanation. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for coming on the show, and uh, maybe uh, three, four months when the dust settles, you'll be able to come on and tell us you know, where we ended up, whether yep. it was a balance of tax cuts and spending increases in different areas and where you think uh, we're headed for this state. All you right? got it. You can count on it. Thank you. Thank Shannon. you, Jamie. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson. Keep watching.